Hey, um, people were wondering, they said, does your shirt say real big? No, it says dream big. So I'm preaching in a dream big t-shirt today. Come on, somebody. We're going to dream big today. And got a message to share with you called, Do You See What I See? I'm full of faith because God has been really faithful to us over the years and because Gonzaga won yesterday. Come on. And Oregon almost won. Man. Rebound. Block out. All right. Make your shots. Want to dive right into the message. And uh, if you're a guest, maybe it's your first or second time here, we're just super pumped that you'd come to uh, any church, especially ours. Come on, New Vintage. Aren't we glad that you're here and uh, your, your family when you're here with us? And so thanks for being here. And today's kind of a special day because we're going to talk about our future as a family. And normally we're really focused on, on uh, just uh, kind of our spiritual lives and who Jesus is. And we are that today. But we're going to spe- especially tackle and talk about what God has for us in the future. And I think it's going to be exciting. So are, I hope some of you are excited about that as well. And we're going to dive right into this incredible scripture I read just about two weeks ago. It's in the book of John. It's chapter 1. Uh, the book of John, John was one of the closest personal friends of Jesus, one of his disciples. And as, as John followed Jesus, he wrote these things down. And we have this, this great two little sections of Scripture. I want to read the first one to you. If you can put that up there, you can follow along. It says, the following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. And this is actually a different John than the one writing this. This is John the Baptist. As Jesus walked by, John the Baptist looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following and said, What do you want? And he, uh, he asked them, and they replied, Rabbi, meaning teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. Come and see. And I love this. you got to think about this. When Jesus calls out to us, kind of begins to draw us to himself. Sometimes we're like, where are you staying? And the funny thing is, is, come on, sometimes Jesus is on the move. And sometimes he's like, you know, come and see. And I love that. So they go and follow him. Just a couple verses down in uh, verse 43. The next day as Jesus uh, decided to go to Galilee, he found Philip. And he said to him, come and follow me. And Philip was from Bethsaida. And Andrew, uh, which was Andrew and Peter's hometown, Philip went to look for Nathanael. And he told Nathanael, we have found the very person that Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus. He's the son of Joseph, Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can any good come from Nazareth? Nobody liked Nazareth back in the day. But I love what Philip says to him. He says, come and see for yourself. Come and see for yourself. And I love these two little subplots in the first opening chapter of the story of Jesus' ministry years because you've got Jesus talking to people directly and saying, come and see for, for yourself. Come and see where I'm staying. And I love that Jesus draws people to himself and he invites us to do two things. One is to see what he sees for our life and to see what he's doing but it's never just to come and see because you can't always see what God is doing unless you get a little bit of get up and come with me going with your vision. Vision and action always go together. And that's how Jesus always did it. Come and see. And sometimes you can't see what's around the corner in your life, what's in the next year, the next months of your life, unless you're going with Jesus. And as you go with Jesus, he begins to show you things you've never seen before. So he says, come and see. And then, man, as you begin to follow Jesus in your life, things begin to start changing, hopefully. You become a little bit more like him. You get frustrated with how much you're not like him. Come on, somebody. And you're trying to follow Jesus in your life. And then you've got some knucklehead friend that complains about everything, Nazareth and everybody, and he's just a complainer. And you go, that guy, my buddy, needs church, needs Jesus. You should come and meet Jesus that I started following. And he goes, where's he from? Nazareth. Nothing good can come out of a place like that. And you know what? A lot of us in this room have had people say that kind of stuff about our lives. Nothing could come from that family line, from that person is a floozy, that person is a joker, that person is a drunk. Nothing good can come from that. And Philip, who's been following Jesus, turns what Jesus said on his friend and says, come and see for yourself. 
And when Jesus begins to get inside your life, you can't help but want to share the viewpoint that Jesus is taking you to. And you go, come on, come and see for yourself. It's the natural progression of things. And I love this. Uh, I, as some of you know, I, I talked about a couple weeks ago, I got in a car accident with Lisa and um, not, we didn't get in a car. I got it. We were in the same car and got in an accident. And we went to the doctors uh, the, and got, uh, they wanted to do x-rays on her neck. And so the doctor comes in, he was all excited. I'm thinking it's good news. And he goes, hey, you broke your neck. And I said, <laughs> he goes, yeah, you have a broken neck. He goes, not from this accident, but like a long, long time ago, you broke your neck. I said, no. He goes, yeah. He goes, the x-rays showed it. You have a, it's a really rare thing. It's called a clay. He gets all excited. He's like, you have a clay shoveler's uh, fracture. And I'm like, what? You know, and he's all excited. He goes, yeah, the x-rays show it. It's kind of rare. And he goes, I've never seen one in person. And I'm thinking, you are really, I said to him, I said, I'm glad I could be here for you, doc. You know, and sometimes you don't even know what's gone on in your own life. I have a broken neck, you know. No, I mean, I can, I can, I can still do all the normal stuff, but there's a fracture in one of my things. And man, sometimes you can't see certain things that other people can see. Can I tell you, when you're following Jesus, he'll see things in your life that you could have never seen. He'll see things in your life your family could have never seen. I mean, it's incredible. Um, I, I want to ask you today to come with me in this next, you know, 30 minutes and see what I believe Jesus has shown me. I want to say to you, come and see for yourself, but I want to lay out some of the things that myself, the pastors of this church, the elders, the prayer team, the broader leadership team, we all are in agreement, man. This is where God has taken us. This is what we see in the future. So I'm, I'm calling out to you today and saying, do you see what I see? Would you come and see that? And I'm going to ask you at the end to see it, and I'm going to ask you to not just see it, but I'm going to ask you to do what Jesus always did. Come and see. Get up, do some action that goes along with the vision. I'm going to call you and ask every person that calls New Vintage Church home, and even people who don't call this home yet, but are stirred by the vision God's given us, to participate with actual money from our bank accounts, our wallets, our comfort zone, and say, I'm willing to give towards what God has shown us is for all of us. That's what we're going to do today. And if you can say amen to that, I'm going to lay this out. Let me just talk about vision for a minute. You know, vision is funny. When um, Lisa and I were moving here with our kids, I'd have to drive back and forth on I-84 between Vancouver and here quite a bit. And it's a, a pretty awful drive for part of it. And then it's a pretty beautiful drive for part of it. You start to get into Hood River and the Dalles, and it starts to get kind of beautiful. And the hillsides look like something out of Lord of the Rings. And uh, it's really kind of a great thing. And my mom, after I'd driven it five or six, seven times, she says, Matt, did you see the uh, big horned sheep up on the mountainsides when you're driving? I said, no. And she goes, they're there. you got to look for them. I said, I've never seen them, Mom. I've been driving this thing twice a week. And she goes, no, they're there. So I'm driving down I-84, and I'm trying to look, you know, without crashing. And I can't see these big horned sheep. She said they have, you know, big curly ram horn uh, things. And I said, they're not there. And so my mom, you know, a couple weeks later, have you seen the, you know, sheep? And I'm like, Mom, you're messing with me. You're trying to play some kind of sick joke. You think this is funny. It's April 2nd, April Fool's or whatever. No, they're there. You got to. She goes, it's, she goes, and she drives out. She goes, I, I figured out where they're at. She gives me a mile marker. She goes, it's somewhere near this zone here. So I'm driving back down the freeway, and I start to slow down at the mile marker. I'm like, okay, I'm in the presence of these invisible sheep. You know, I'm trying to look and drive and and as I look, I, I don't see them, and I'm frustrated. I'm angry that somebody else has seen something that I can't see. I feel like they're playing a trick, like when the kids are in the parking lot going, oh, do you see it? But there's nothing up there, you know? And everybody's like, oh, yeah. And everybody's going, you know, what is that? And so on my way back, I look again, and sure enough, I see this ram get up on the ledge and just kind of like look at me. And I was like, ah! you know, I'm like driving down the road. And I'm like, they're, there, they're, they're real, they're alive. So we get in the car with the kids, and I'm, I'm like, you guys, you got to look for these sheep. They're amazing. And they're like, never seen them. They're not there. You know what? If you've not seen something, you don't believe it exists. But if somebody can convince you to look for it and see it, then come on, vision is like faith-based. You, you, you have to believe that something's there if you've never seen it. I dr have driven by those mountains every time. Every time now as we drive by. 
I slow down and I look to see those sheep because they're so magnificent and we see them most of the time. And for me, in my personal life, it's uh, got its own meaning of what it means to me. But vision is like that. Somebody has to tell you something that you haven't seen does exist in the future. And let me just preach about Jesus for a second and tell you that if you have not started to follow Jesus, he sees something better in your future than what you've experienced every single day that you've lived on this planet. And I'm telling you, you go, no. And these Christians drive me nuts talking about church and Jesus and the Bible and all these things. And I want to say, it's not nuts. Jesus is real, and he's changed some of our lives. And you need to come and see for yourself. He will not disappoint you. He will surprise you. It won't be like you thought. It'll be different, but his spirit is alive. Jesus really is resurrected, and he's alive today. And he's changing people's lives. And I'm calling you to come and see that and see him and follow after him in your life. Here's a couple thoughts about vision just real quick. Number one, vision is always seeing something other people don't. If you're a person who has vision, you're going to see things other people don't see. And you're going to be like, no, I got a dream. I got a big dream t-shirt. Come on. And vision, secondly, is from God. When you get a heavenly vision for your own life or as we get one for our church, those dreams are special. They're real. The vision is from God. Paul talked about it in Acts 26. He was actually on trial. He was going to go to jail. And he stood up in front of these um, people in the court and he said, I saw these things. Jesus spoke this to me, opened up my eyes. And he goes, so I decided I would not disobey the heavenly vision. And so even though it meant for him, sacrifice changed his life. For him, it ultimately meant going to jail and dying on because of his association with Jesus Christ. But he said, I won't disobey the vision that I know was from God. And I love that about vision. Third about vision is that vision can unify people. And I want to share this scripture with you. When the first uh, church began to start after Jesus ascends up to heaven, lets his disciples loose on the world, and they began to preach about Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus begins to show up and do miracles. I want you to see how powerful the unity was uh, for them to do all the work that they were called to do. It says all the believers were united. They were united in their heart and their mind. They had a vision of something they were trying to accomplish, and it bound them together. They felt that what they owned was not their own, so that they shared everything that they had. Man, come on. That would be a great group of people to live amongst. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's blessing was upon them all. It's interesting that God's blessing is upon people who give stuff away. When you can share everything you've got, it's interesting that God goes, I like those kind of people, and I'm going to let my blessing be on them. The blessing was upon them all. They, there were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them, and they'd bring the money to the apostles and give to those in need. It was an incredible expression of generosity and unity around the vision that they had that Jesus had laid out for them. I, I want to talk about our vision in our church. We have a vision statement in our church, and it's uh, three words, and most of you have heard it before, but these are the most important things at New Vintage Church. Jesus is number one, people and cities. I want you to say those. It's the only time I have you do this today. But I want you to say it out loud with me. Come on, Jesus, people, cities. That's the vision for our church. We want a church that makes Jesus happy, number one. If you're not happy, but Jesus is happy with the service, that's a better win for Jesus and for us, right? Now, I hope uh, that Jesus makes you happy today, but ultimately my job is to make him happy. And secondly, what makes Jesus happy is when people's lives are touched, because that's what Jesus loves the most. He loves humanity. And then we feel called, in our vision, to touch the whole Tri-Cities area, all of it, and we're going to go after that. Our mission statement is right below that. We exist to inspire vibrant faith in Jesus. That's why we're here. This is the calling of our church. It's not to be this or that or maybe something you're hoping we are. Here's what we are. We're called to be here to inspire humanity in the Tri-Cities and beyond 
to have an alive, living relationship with Jesus Christ. Not to just hear about him, not to know a little bit of Bible, but never have it impact your life. No, we want people to have an alive, vibrant faith in Jesus. Because Jesus is worth that. And he doesn't want you to settle for a little head knowledge, but never have your life get changed. Vibrant faith. And then our goal is to get the gospel to everybody in the Tri-Cities area. That's a big, audacious, hairy goal right there. Come on. And it was bigger to us when we started the church in the movie theater with just a handful of people. It's still massive to think about. We were driving in from Yakima. We got up, uh, and did the turn, coming down the 395, getting ready to go to our house. And I'm like, babe, there it is. And she's like, I remember when we first drove in here in the middle of the night, and it was dark. And then what is this beautiful city right here? And we were just captivated and sharing our love story with the Tri-Cities last night as we were driving into town. And I'm telling you that we feel that God put that as a vision in our heart to get the gospel to every single one of those little light specks all around. And then nobody, like, who are we going to choose? Do we go, that part of town doesn't get the gospel. Those kind of people are that side of the river or, come on, who are we going to exclude? And Jesus can do so much with the little that we have if we'll just give it to him. He'll bless it. So that's our goal. You know, we see church having five campuses in the future and we want to see God do that so that there's places for people to go and worship and meet and get established in their life and learn about Jesus together. It's part of the vision we have. We're not going to be a church that's always going to be about who we are on the inside and growing personally and personal gain and, you know, um, making us feel better, learning more for us, all about me, all about the inside of the church, all about the church people. Come on, it's not going to be us. We're not an inside the church kind of people. We're an outside. We're, you know what? How about this? Catch me outside. How about that? That's where we're going to be, preaching the gospel. Not going to be inside. Let me just read you. <laughs> that was fun. Let me just read you a couple of the things on social media. and People have said some of the nicest things, but here, here's a little taste of how people's lives have been impacted at our church. friend wrote this. I'm at church right now. It's Youth Sunday. I cannot even sing because I'm crying like a baby. The youth worship team bringing the sweetest presence of God that I have ever experienced in years. The kingdom of God is strong, and we adults are in good hands in the future. I'm blessed. Another Facebook friend just wrote this. I've been coming to New Vintage uh, for the past two years, and New Vintage is amazing! Exclamation points and emojis. I won't, you know. It's hard to explain the way it makes you feel. As the preaching uh, of God's word happens, you go through so many emotions. Man, it's crazy. Our church is like no other. I want to thank you for being yourself. This was to me, and for us to be ourselves. And to always want more out of our walk with God. Anyways, I've been here for two years. And my sister, uh, trying to get my sister to get back into church. I tell her how amazing New Vintage is and how down to earth everyone is. And everyone is so welcoming. Today was the day she came with two of her friends. And they fell in love with the church. Jesus, or she said she felt the Lord's presence in her today. And it was so emotional for her. Just want you to know you're truly touching people every day. Thank you so much. And I'm just going, man, I could tell you the story of a couple Sundays ago where, uh, you know, Lisa and I always sit in these first two seats just so it's easy for us to get up here. And people started filling up on the front row that we didn't really know. And this lady that we do know comes in and she goes, she goes, these people act like they own the place. And I said, it's all right. She goes, no, they're my friends. She goes, I just, you know, there's my friend that I invited. She's been coming for a couple months. And then this other person from work, she's been coming for uh, two or three weeks. She invites her brother, and her brother's now bringing her kids, and they're sitting just wherever they want. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, come on. Come and see for yourself. And that's how it goes. And then the last one is this. In 2012, in January, before we were even in this building, we were in the movie theater. We only had about five more months in the movie theater, six more months. And here's what I wrote. Back then, I'm truly dumbfounded at how good God is. Last weekend with our two services, which by the way, that second service that was in the movie theater was like 12 people, so you know, it sounded really cool to other church leaders are like, wow, you're doing two services. I'm like, yeah, it's powerful, but it was like <laughs> just a lot of work for a couple of us, you know. I'd be like, Austin, you're in this, you're, you can come to this one, we need more people in there. <laughs> Tenants went up 10% today. All right, I'm truly dumbfounded at how good God is, 2012. 
Last weekend with our two services, we had a record 269 people come to church. Five or six people responded to the gospel. And at the Youth Invite Night outreach, uh, four first-time responses to the gospel with a record 51 students in attendance. And we were praising God, thinking we were changing the world. But we were changing the world for those four people at Youth Night, five or six people on that Sunday, the people who didn't have a church coming and finding a place where they felt like they could fit in at a movie theater. And I'm telling you, we're going to keep doing that. It's about people's lives getting changed. Now, step one for us for the future is this. We've got to buy this building. It's time to buy this building. This is what we're going to do. Step one. Now, I love one of my friends said, you know, I love, we need to call this the facility because it's not about the building. It facilitates the ministry of the gospel. And this is going to be a facility for us. Let me tell you about our historical growth. Since we started, we've grown 16 to 25 percent annually which is pretty incredible by the numbers. We're going to be over 1,000 people in average attendance by the fall. Our average attendance so far this year is 909, just so you know. And in three years, as you do the math, we're going to be in three years at 2020, we're going to be at 2,000 people. And it sounds like a lot of people, except let me just explain something. There's like 300,000 people in this town that don't go to church anywhere, don't know Jesus And so we could get all excited and go, oh, man, that's an amazing number. I'm glad for those 2,000 people. But what we really got to go and get serious about with our faith is, are we going to let Jesus give us his grand vision to reach every single person that needs the gospel? And are we going to do everything that we can do to reach them? And we have to decide that. All right, so why would we buy this building? Because we already don't fit in this building, right? That's a good question. So let me give you some reasons why we're going to buy this building. Number one, we're buying this building because it's a great location, easy access from all three cities, and people know that we're here. People are starting to go, oh, New Vintage Church. And if you say we're by Chuck E. Cheese, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the second reason is this. We buy this building, and we're leasing it right now. We go from leasing it to owning it. We're going to save over two grand a month just in our payment. So that's pretty awesome. If we purchase this, the third reason is that if we purchase this, then we can expand on this property. We met with the city and we can add on to this property in the future. And that's what we plan to do and that's what I'm going to cast some vision for right now. Here's some details about how we're going to buy this building. First of all, I want you to know that this church has never had any debt. We don't have any debt right now. You guys, we've lived debt free, which is great. Okay, So we don't have to pay off debt. We're in a great spot with the bank. The cost of this building is going to be with, uh, is $1.2 million for this building, the property it sits on, and the second one. I want to show you an aerial picture of the property that we're going to buy. I think it's next. So you can see this is uh, looking straight down from the sky there. New Vintage Church. You can guess what that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, somebody. All right. If we buy this building, we get lot B, but we really felt like it was strategic to buy lot D as well so we could go all the way to the street. And so that's what our deal with the owners is. And what's great is we calculated with what we want to do in the future that gives us enough parking spots where we can do what God's uh, led us to do. So we're buying the building and the second piece of the property all the way out to the street there where our sign is. Our sign is on the far edge, right on the edge of uh, where our property line is. So here's a couple of the numbers for the details. We need to get 30% down payment on that 1.2 million. It's about $360,000 that we need. 360,000. Here's the great news. People have already, without us doing a launch like today, already have given a lot of money to our church towards a future building program. And money that has been given and money that we have set aside month to month trying to be good stewards is $240,000 in rough numbers that we've already got towards that. So we need to raise $120,000 in order to do this, and we have till the end of August to do this. I think it's doable. I think, I think we can rise up, but I'm not done yet. I don't think Jesus is done yet. But wait, there's more. You want that knife? What about the little Jinchu knife?
Our first goal, step one is this. We want to raise $250,000, and here's why. That would give us enough to, to finish off the down payment, and then there's some work that's got to be done on this old building. I don't know if you've noticed the parking lot that you parked on. I don't know if you've noticed, but some of the, the doors need to be redone. Like, there's some things just to exist in here. We have used <laughs> this building, and it just needs to be maintained. And so that's our goal by August is to raise 250000 I want to say this, that we want to uh, do this all together, too. Uh, you might be on a fixed income. You might, you know, not have a lot of money. And, and, and the great thing about the way God's always set up finances is people give the same kind of sacrifice, but not the same amounts. And so what might be, you know, easy for Connor to do a $100,000 gift, no sweat off his back, but... Ten bucks for Derek might be really tough. But you know what God wants from us is he wants all of us to go just a little bit of ouch in our wallet. Like, man, I want, I want to really, I want to stretch myself. I'm going to tell you that if everybody decides to get on board and stretch just a little bit, equal stress, equal joy, equal sacrifice, and we all do it, we're going to accomplish something miraculous. And I think that's what God wants us to do. And so we've got to do that. Now, you need to know this. I want you to see the first service that was in this building. We took a picture that day. The screen was over here, and we had one service back then. Those were good days. And uh, I rem we, we didn't have enough chairs. These brown chairs were on order. And so we had some green chairs from the old kitchen pasta mamas in here. We told people to bring their own chairs for service. We had people on lawn chairs, big old, like, NASCAR, Coors, beer, you know, couple, they're just sitting in church like, this is awesome, you know, eating Doritos. And it was, that's, that's that service. And we were so pumped to be there. Can I tell you that the people at that time, it was about 250 people in average attendance. And we rose up at that time in 2012, and we raised $72,000 in three months. We didn't know if we could do it. We didn't know if we could do it, but we did. And everybody got on board. And I'll tell you, it was like people got excited to give financially to it and that got you here and the next service got them here and the night service that sacrifice back then got all those people here so whatever we do come on. is just come and see it come up a little higher I want you to see the next couple of years some of your friends your family you know your co-workers you might have some family members you don't want coming to church with you. I get that. Uh, but come on. They need Jesus, right? Let me give you a little timeline. And let me just, as we go to the timeline here in just a second, let me just tell you what my faith is. And I, I can't shake it, so I'm going to say it. And I ran it by the elders. I think we need to raise over $1 million. If we raise over $1 million... We could either pay off this entire building just all at once, just boom. If we raise a million dollars, we could buy this, and then you're going to see on the time frame we could skip ahead a couple stages. And I think that's the calling that God has for us. Now, that's going to take everybody doing something, whether it's your $10 or your $100,000 or whatever is in between. Let me show you the timeline of what we feel called to. And, you know, I, I keep hearing uh, on, on, the, on my iPod... <laughs> That song, oh yeah, I'm going to do it. <laughs> if the wind in my sails on the sea stays behind me, <laughs> no one knows how far it goes. Oh, 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 no. Nobody, don't you know this song? I felt all by myself right there. Listen, here's the timeline. Let's start going through this. Number one, we got to buy this building. By August of 2017, we've got to buy this building. And we're starting our campaign today. It's called Own It. And while I'm going through the timeline, our ushers are going to start handing these out to you. One per family. It says Own It. And it's a commitment card. And you're not going to turn this in today. Uh, you're going to hold on to this and pray over it. And you're going to turn this in the last Sunday of April. In this, and we're going to believe God to really uh, do something miraculous with all of us participating. So just hold on to that. But let me walk you through this timeline. August of 2017, we're going to buy this building. We're going to go from leasing it to owning it. 
Next click. Late in 2017, if we raise at least our $250,000, we are going to do some work on this campus. Get it up to par. Next, uh, January of 2018, we're going to launch a Pasco campus. Now, people keep asking me details about that. I want you to know I have no clue what I'm doing right there. I just know what God told us to do. So we're going to get there, but we got to get through Easter's. <laughs> we got to get through Easter and this. We got to buy this. But we are going to do that because God set that in front of us to begin to reach into Pasco. All right, next on our timeline. Stage two is what we're calling this. Stage two remodel is this. Some of you might know that coming up here in two weeks, we're going to launch our video feed, live worship over there, but the sermon will be live fed into the other room. And that's going to give us about 100 chairs over there. But stage two is that if we remodel this building and on the inside of it, where it's at right now, we're going to knock that back wall back, and we're able to get rid of those offices. We're going to have to remodel the bathrooms and move them which is expensive, but if we do that, we're going to get 140 more seats in here, and we'll go from 300 seats to 470 seats in here. And that'll help a lot. That's stage two, and I don't have a timeline for that, but that'll be a great day. That'll increase our capacity to do what God's called us to do. And then uh, stage three is to build a brand new structure, 700-seat venue on this property right out front of this building. We build a brand new sanctuary right out front, and... This will probably become kids' classrooms and some offices. We've never had offices at this building. And we'll make the big room over there will be the entrance to our lobby. that will be nice and big. And it'll be amazing. We'll have space for the kids and all that. That's stage three, and that's down the road. And then the last thing is this. The timeline that we don't have a date for is this. To launch other campuses, the other three that we feel called to do, one at a time. This is the vision that God has laid out for us. I wish I had... More details, but I know these things for sure as we've prayed and walked it through. We will have, let me just say this, we will have another more detailed, what we're going to call a master plan, where I can have some time to share with you more details about some of these things here and show you some drawings and all of those things. We're going to do that in about two months. So you'll hear about that after Easter. We'll start advertising that date and you could come out to that event uh, and and hear about our master plan for the future. But for right now, we really wanted to just let you see what's in the near future for us. Now, let me show you financially how this is going to work. Can we go to the next click here? Right here, we have to get a minimum of 120000 to buy this building. But we think we can raise at least 250000 right? Are you with me? Yeah. All right. Let's go to the next click. If we get 250000 we can do the work on this campus. Next click. If we get... Uh, $500,000, uh, we can do work on here and blow this wall out and move the bathrooms and make this thing, you know, seat almost 500 people per service. And that's just for the adults. And then the next one, if we get $1.5 million, we can build the brand new uh, sanctuary out front here. And let me say it like this. If we actually get like the million or 1.2 in this year, we can skip stage two and jump to stage three. And in the long run, that'll save us money. And we can just believe God for big things to start growing our church in ways that we feel called to do. I, I got faith. Yeah. It's stretching my faith. I got to tell you, I did not want to put a $1 million something something up there. <laughs> but I, I believe that that's what God's calling us to do. Yeah. To skip stage two. This would have been a good title. Skip stage two. Go to stage three. But let me put the last click up there. The level of our giving affects the speed of our vision. That's just the truth of it. If people in this church decide we're not unified on this, it's a great idea, Pastor. Somebody else will pay for it. I'm going to cheer you on, but I'm not going to contribute. Then that's fine. You can always come and always enjoy these services because that's why we're here. But you will miss out on an opportunity to be a part of sowing some seed that one day becomes an orchard, that we go, we, we, we saw it all. We got to watch it. We were a part of that. And, and let me just tell you, I, I love Pastor Brian Houston from Hillsong Church. He says it this way, great churches aren't built on the gifts or the talents of a few, but on the sacrifice of many. And I'm not doing this unless we all do this together. 
I mean, I am going to still do it, I guess. I actually have to, so I will. But I, I don't want to do it. I want to do it with everybody. And listen, it doesn't matter the dollar amount. I'm just saying, I want everybody to go, you know what? I care about what God's done in my life here. And I care about what God's going to do tomorrow in the next couple of years. And so I'm going to believe that God can take my little. And when it adds to the mix with the faith and the favor of God, it's going to do something marvelous. I'm going to be a part of that. It's called opportunity investment. If you don't give to it, you miss out on the opportunity. And here, here's something I read that was so powerful. I read this in Chase the Lion, the book. It's about the online uh, eyeglasses uh, company called uh, Warby Parker. Has anybody heard of Warby Parker? You can order your, on, your uh, eyeglasses there. Here's what it says in the book. In 2008, four students set out to revolutionize the eyewear industry by offering fashionable frames at a fraction of the price online. A man named Adam Grant. Adam Grant was offered an opportunity to invest in Warby Parker, but he turned it down. And Adam Grant was a big wig in the glasses industry at the time. He said, if it was a good idea, it would have already been done. Plus, who's going to buy prescription glasses online? The founders of Warby Parker expected to sell a pair or two glasses per day right out of the gate. They had to put 20,000 orders on a waiting list in their first month. In five years' time, Warby Parker would be valued at more than $1 billion. And Adam Grant said it was the worst financial decision I ever made. It didn't cost him one penny in actual cost. It cost him millions in opportunity cost. And I look at that when it comes to the kingdom of God. I'm going to invest I want you to know Lisa and I are going to give sacrificially out of our family income to this project. Just because we're the pastors doesn't mean we're not Christians and don't give to this church. We're on, the, on board with this. It's an opportunity for us to invest and see what God will do in the future. We're going to own it. Everybody get your card? Did everybody get a card? Here's the timeline for that. I, I want to put one more click up there. We put on there, it's our vision, it's our building, it's our responsibility because this is not my, it's not Matt Moult's dream. Come on, this is Jesus' dream for us. It's ours. And we have an opportunity to invest in this. And I think that's awesome. The cards, if you can't be here like on April 30th, if you could turn it into the office before that, it would be great with whatever God puts on your heart to do. But April 30th, we're going to bring them all together. And then the first Sunday in May, we're going to announce you know, what the commitment level is, and we're going to be, just celebrate all the goodness of God. It's going to be a, a wonderful time. I wanted to give you time. I wanted to give a couple weeks in between for people to pray through that. And then your commitment has to be, uh, you know, made by that time, but then the money doesn't have to come in until the end of August. The last Sunday in August, I think, is the 27th, and so maybe you go, man, I know I've got a business deal or something's going to shift and change, and so I'm going to give a commitment now knowing I'm going to be able to to do that by this time. So pray over it. If you're married, you better talk to your spouse about it. <laughs> you know, and you, you might need to really do some research and count the cost and all those things. And I don't want anybody to, nobody should suffer this. This should just be something that the Holy Spirit should lead you to something that is just a little beyond what you could do. Just like, oh yeah, it'd be easy. He'll ask you to give a little bit beyond that. That's just the way he is. And you watch, he'll do a miracle for you. He'll supply it. He'll bring it in. He's done it all the time. We're going to uh, receive our offering in just a minute here. But, in fact, maybe the ushers could bring up the offering buckets right now. This is not for you to turn the cards in. This is just for our regular offering. But I, I felt like it would be apropos for us to take a moment as a church and really pray just about our offering. You need to understand something. I, I so appreciate the generosity of this church. We don't make a big deal about money at our church. I don't know if you noticed that. We go really fast through our offerings. We don't do a big talk, teaching. We don't pressure people. This is pretty uncomfortable, actually, for me in some ways to do this. Uh, but I actually believe it is God's will for us. But I want to take time today, and I want us to pray over the offering. And maybe you gave last week, you give every other week, or whatever your case is. It's not about you giving today. But can we pray about our hearts and our financial giving and just go, God, take what we give and plant it like seed for the future so that hundreds and thousands of people can come to know you. 
I want you to pray with me. I want to pray over your offering uh, today. Jesus, I really am thankful and grateful for all that you've done and all that you've got to do, all that you want to do in us. And Lord, I just thank you for every family that's represented here. God, there's a sense of collective faith that you have something great for our future. And we want to be a part of that. We want to see that we're not giving into a void. We're not giving in uh, money into the church out of uh, uh, some weird sense of obligation. We're giving because it's the kingdom of God and you're going to use this money to do great things. And we're going to see people's lives changed in part because of the money that we give. So God, please stir our hearts. Let us have a fresh outlook on this. And God, bless what we offer you today and multiply it and do your will with it. Let everything that we do in the future, let us get great deals on it. Let us be good stewards, but somehow breathe your blessing on our personal finances and let us see ourselves as like a funnel for you to just flow through in a financial way. I thank you for the faith and the generosity of people here today. Amen. You can pass uh, the green buckets. If you're new to our church and you want to participate in giving, you can. Uh, we also have, by our coffee booth, a black box with envelopes. You can drop it in there. And you can give online on our website and on our app. It makes it really easy uh, to do that. I want to do one thing before we sing this last song together. And I know that the things are being passed around, but I'd like everybody to listen to me as close as you could. It really is about the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why I'm here. I, I would be a pretty messed up man, worse than I am now, if Jesus had not gotten involved in my life. I'm thankful that he saw something in me I didn't see. I'm glad he said, come with me. Come and see what I'm doing. And I've tried to live my life as a give back to him by saying to people, come and see for yourself.